Do you guys hear that too? The recording in progress. Yes. She uh she freaks me out a little bit. Uh, that voice. So okay. <laughs> All right. So we'll go ahead and um kick off. So William Lucas is going to be sharing our the next part in the the SCADA series, uh, focusing on Modbus. So um, thank you, William, uh, and thank you everyone for for joining. Um, I'm going to also put a link to our um, CTF for that's happening um, this Wednesday, September 1st. All levels of expertise are welcome. Um, and uh, it's going to be a bit of, you know, go at your own pace with your team. Uh, we're also going to live stream on Twitch. So uh, if you haven't registered already, I'm going to drop a link in the chat uh, so you can go ahead and do that. Um, and with that, I will go ahead and turn it over to you, William. Thank you. Uh, let's see. So I'm going to share my screen and in just a moment. Okay. Are, are people able to see a uh, sort of PowerPoint right now? Yes. Okay. Yep. Fantastic. It's a little bit tricky uh, doing all this on Zoom. Okay, so uh, welcome everyone. Uh, so this is SCADA 102, SCADA protocols, and really we're focusing on uh, Modbus here. Um, let's see. So I want to give a quick background for those of you who didn't attend uh, Mary's SCADA 101 presentation. This slide is just uh, kind of shamelessly uh, ripped off from that. So SCADA stands for, I'm gonna admit this person here. Um, SCADA stands for Supervisory Control and Data Acquisition. Um, and that's basically, that's a control system, right? We've, we've got uh, processes going on uh, and there are sensors that are collecting data. There are actuators that are, you know, modifying the environment. Those could be motors, switches, things like that. Um, and then you really have some, some kind of computer, some logic that uh, ties it all together. So some synonyms you might see are OT, so operational technology, ICS, industrial control system, DCS, which I haven't really seen, uh, distributed control system. Um, there are very nuanced differences, but really these, these kind of mean the same thing, especially as far as um, for the level of uh, detail we require. Um, and please feel free to ask questions. I don't know if I'll see if people do the raise hand or Maybe at the end of each slide, I'll, I'll see if there are any questions, but you know, I, I'd love to make this interactive. Uh, and to be honest, I don't have uh, the most materials. So any, any questions you have, I'm sure, they're, I'm sure they're going to be relevant for you know, uh, other people in, the, um, in this presentation. So please feel free to um, sort of interrupt with questions. You know. And I'll, I'll monitor the chat as well, William. Fantastic, thank you. Okay. So really what we're, what we're getting into here are protocols. Uh, this is sort of meant to be very introductory. So if you don't even know what a protocol is, you know, that's great. I, I guess that's what this slide is for. Uh, so here we mean a communication protocol. Protocol is simply a set of rules, okay? So, you know, you could have, a, have all kinds of protocols, but we're kind of talking about um, communication protocols that computers use. Um, and so these are very common in networking. So there's IP, right, internet protocol, TCP, transmission control protocol, UDP, I think that's user datagram, the, uh, the U always confuses me, HTTP, hypertext transfer protocol. Um, so these are all really foundations of modern computer use, uh, even though all of these, these four protocols in particular are very old, and uh, that's going to come into play with Modbus as well. Um, so those of you that do have a bit more of a background and are familiar with the OSI model, um, you know, that's, that's great. Uh, so it's kind of a stack of different um, networking layers all the way down from, you know, your, your physical cables and things like that up to the application layer where, uh, you know, your, your sort of end product typically lies. Um, when we're talking about Modbus, we're going to kind of briefly touch on the transport layer that it uses. And then I suppose this would really just be the application layer. Sometimes these layers get blurry uh, as well, but uh, we're, we're gonna zero in on Modbus pretty soon. Any questions so far? I see a few things in the chat. Oh, I guess that's a little bit off topic. Okay, so no questions yet? All right. Oh, 
Sorry about that. Okay. So we're going to talk about protocol analysis now. So protocol analysis is a super, super useful uh, skill, definitely in CTFs. Um, at Percival, we use it all the time at work. Uh, you know, I guess it depends on what you're doing, but basically if you're interacting with, um, with devices over the network, uh, it, this is a really good skill to have. And uh, what's really nice is that the, what seems to be really the ubiquitous tool for this is, uh, is free and open source, uh, Wireshark. And this is kind of the logo here. They keep changing their logo, but this, is, this appears to be the latest one. Um, and so protocol analysis basically uh, consists of taking, um, really can be any protocol traffic, but we're typically talking about network protocols, uh, Modbus included, uh, and kind of, capturing that data and then viewing that capture and trying to um, interpret it. And so this can absolutely be done manually, um, but really, you know, to scale things. And if you're dealing with complicated scenarios, you want to use an automated tool like Wireshark. Um, there are other ones out there, but Wireshark is really the dominant one. Uh, another really nice functionality for um, most programs like Wireshark are packet sniffing or packet capturing. So that simply means that you can uh, actively monitor network traffic and then you can either, excuse me, you can either um, save it for analysis later, you know, send it to another machine, whatever, or you can kind of actively uh, filter things and uh, really inspect packets. Um, and by packets, I, I mean network data uh, for these purposes. So um, protocols have specifications, right? Protocols are simply sets of rules. So Wireshark uh, is sort of made aware um, of specifications of various protocols. Um, people very familiar with Wireshark might be familiar with dissectors. That's, that's pretty much the thing that um, almost like cuts the packet open, right? It sort of, um, sort of slices it up based on the protocol, uh, based on the rules that it has to follow. And then, um, sort of uh, diagrams and explains it. Let's see. Yeah, and Wireshark's really versatile. Uh, you can have things outputted in a format that might be sort of suitable for a report, um, but you can also sort of um, interpret things in real time and, and kind of uh, get creative depending on uh, what you need to do. Any questions? please feel free. I know it looks like there are quite a few people in here now. So if you've got a question, I'm sure someone else does as well. Okay. So this is just a really quick um, sort of screenshot overview of Wireshark. Um, we'll be uh, going through this. So, you know, this won't be the only time you see Wireshark. This is just a static screenshot, but I'll, I'll uh, pull that up in the demo near the end. Uh, let's see. So I just want to highlight a few things. Is this text readable for people? You don't need to see like, you don't need to read every word, but can, can people make out what's there? Does someone mind yes. letting me know? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, yes. Yeah, so um, this is Wireshark running on Linux. Uh, it's also available on Windows. Looks pretty much the same. Um, and there are a lot of different, there's a lot of functionality. So in this case, uh, so this is a, a PCAP file. PCAP is short for packet capture. You might also see PCAP NG, so that's like PCAP next generation. Um, the, these are, it's a little bit of a more efficient format, but they're very similar. Basically, they're files that can be loaded into Wireshark uh, as well as uh, equivalent tools. And you can uh, utilize them to really nicely analyze uh, what's going on with the network traffic. In this case, uh, it was a network capture that had a number of different, um, you know, packets with different protocols. and I use the filter bar here to just filter HTTP. It's as easy as it looks. I typed in HTTP and hit enter. Um, and Wireshark's aware of a whole lot of protocols and you can filter, you can filter Wireshark when you're capturing for efficiency, uh, but it's a little bit restricted based on how um, sort of the networking stacks work and you can usually only filter by port, but uh, the filter is really granular afterwards when you have sort of a, a previously captured uh, PCAP or if you're just filtering something in real time, but you're not changing what gets saved, it's sort of like a, you know, maybe in Excel when you do a filter, you don't lose the rest of the table, but you you just kind of see what what you're interested in. So anyway, uh, I was able to filter just for HTTP, uh, just because it's a, a really simple protocol, um, at least as far as um, not being encrypted at all, and just kind of ha having some uh, with Wireshark's dissector having some elements that are 
are pretty clearly human readable. Um, so, you know, this is an HTTP GET request. Um, and then we've got different things that are really nicely added by Wireshark uh, from the dissector that sort of explain what's going on. So I'm not gonna dwell on that because this is HTTP, but I just wanted a really quick example. I guess there were a few other things I wanted to highlight. So all of these columns are, you know, sortable. Um, you can you can filter on them, and that involves the filter bar. But you can even right click, and even if you don't exactly know the protocol, but you see a packet that you like, and you want to see all the packets of that protocol, you can do that. Uh, has some really nice information here, and you can also add columns, remove columns. Uh, it's very it's very flexible. It's a really great tool. Um, and then so. The top here, this is sort of a view of all the packets. This number are actually the number of like sort of the, not a TCP sequence number, but sort of the overall sequence number of the packet within the PCAP. So the reason why we're starting at 633 and these aren't sequential is because we're filtering. Most of the packets weren't HTTP. And in fact, that's even displayed in the bottom right here. Um, and so this is sort of an overview. You click the packet and this middle window as well as this bottom window um, will will reflect the packet that you selected. This text here is just uh, just the title. Uh, that, that doesn't show up in Wireshark. Um, so this middle, this middle pane here has the various uh, sort of layers of, really kind of layers of the OSI, OSI model or uh, kind of components of the packet. So at the start here, uh, we've got frames. So this is really the physical layer, goes down to ethernet, IP. This is our transport layer. In this case, it's TCP. Uh, and the Modbus that we'll be discussing, uh, that communication takes place over TCP. Um, and then this is our application layer, in this case, HTTP. Um, when we look at the, the Modbus packet or packets, it will be Modbus over TCP. Um, so let's see. And then this bottom guy here. So this is a hex dump. So this is um, taking the raw bytes, which are these first two columns. The raw bytes of the packets in case that is useful. Um, so not all protocols are actually are sort of what is known as like ASCII or I guess text-based protocols where you can really read what's going on. So with HTTP, you can. So Wireshark adds a little bit of stuff with the dissector, but it's not too crazy. We'll see with Modbus, Wireshark um, really makes things a lot more clear so that you don't have to look at some sort of diagram or table like we'll have uh, later in this presentation. But you'll really just be able to look at Wireshark and not necessarily need another reference, which is pretty great. Um, yeah, so I know that was a lot. Uh, I'm talking quickly and trying to slow down, but uh, are did, there any questions? Yeah, we did get one question mm -hmm. um, from Danny Williams. So does Wireshark handle Modbus and other SCADA protocols natively or does it need a plugin? That's a fantastic question. Uh, so it absolutely handles Modbus natively. Um, other SCADA protocols uh, encompasses a lot of protocols. Uh, so I know it, it handles some common ones like uh, Siemens S7 comms. Uh, I can't think of any others off the top of my head, but I would say common protocols, absolutely. Uh, common SCADA protocols. If it's more obscure, maybe not. Uh, at Percival, we've actually sort of uh, extended a little bit uh, of Wireshark's functionality for a protocol that we needed to learn more about. Wireshark had a dissector, but we wanted to sort of add more capabilities. So what you'll see is that the more common protocols will have you know, fantastic support. Ones that are more obscure will often be included, but maybe not, um, you know, th they might not uh, handle sort of every like nook and cranny of, of the protocol. Uh, yeah, so that's a really great question. Um, as far as Wireshark plugins, I'm, I'm not sure. I know Wireshark supports, um, adding code sort of built in with C, also with uh, Lua. I'm not sure if the Lua code works as a plugin, but really if something wasn't sort of in the main Wireshark sort of, uh, you know, release the download, I've only had luck from people who actually forked the source code. I, I don't know if there's a plugin structure, uh, but sometimes, you know, if you kind of Google and it's not supported in Wireshark, you might find that someone has made their own sort of open source fork that does uh, have the support that they need. So I hope that uh, answered that question okay. Um, anything else on this slide? Okay. Yep, so now, uh, oops, sorry about that. Now we're finally getting to Modbus. Uh, so Modbus uh, was originally 
still is, but it, uh, its features or capabilities uh, have kind of grown. There's sort of some parallel protocols, but it started out as a serial communications protocol. So serial is, uh, you could think of it as like, I'm trying to think of a good example for someone who's um, maybe doesn't deal with things like that. Um, it's uh, very simple. So you can have serial com communication over, you know, something like two wires, a lot of really old, um, you know, rather than USB, some very, you know, very old computing devices only had serial communications. Uh, what we see now is that in sort of the SCADA field, um, even devices that are really modern and have these other, um, you know, communication capabilities, they typically also are able to communicate over serial. Occasionally, you know, they might send serial data and not even have the port for it. And you have to kind of do some sort of conversion or uh, like have some sort of hardware dongle. But uh, serial communication is, is still very common uh, among industrial devices. Um, and so it seems like uh, Mobbus gets its name from a company that was originally called Modicon. Uh, Schneider Electric bought it. This protocol is very, very old, right? Uh, 1979. So for reference, I think the like the World Wide Web and the first web browser and stuff like that. So not the internet, but the World Wide Web that you know really provides the usability for for most of us was I think that was in 1991. So this protocol, uh, you know, really predates a lot of uh, very fundamental and themselves very old protocols. Uh, so if you're thinking about um, security implications, if uh, you know that's I'm sure this isn't the most secure. Uh, if people are familiar with sort of the security implications of HTTP, not HTTPS, but HTTP, where um, packets are transmitted in clear text, which is just like uh, Modbus, you really don't want to be using that for anything remotely sensitive. Um, so this is really a protocol that um, is widely used even still, but if you're able to see it, you know, if, if for some reason there's Modbus communication on a network, or, you know, it, basically if you're able to sort of capture packets, you're gonna be able to see Modbus communication uh, and that that is often not a good thing for, for the party sending that communication. Um, so got a little bit off topic, but um, examples of other SCADA protocols here, we've got BACnet. So I think that stands for like building automation control. Um, so it can be used for like HVAC systems, things like that. We've got uh, CAN, so control it controller area network uh, that's really common in vehicles. Um, SIP, common industrial protocol. So various PLCs use that. I think Alan Bradley uses that and I'm sure other vendors as well. Uh, Z-Wave is actually more of a home automation protocol. So not so much SCADA, but um, kind of does the same things. And I mentioned that because some of you might, you know, have uh, Z-Wave devices at home. And so Mobbus, uh, it's, it's really a de facto standard. So it's royalty free. So people didn't have to pay to use it. So uh, you know, they use it a lot. And also it's just so, so old that uh, people are familiar with it. Um, and, you know, it, it tends to stick around sort of like uh, those those networking protocols as well. We're sort of slowly seeing IPv6 being adopted, but but IPv4, sort of the original one, uh, is so uh, prevalent now. Uh, any any more questions for this slide? Well, this is Yetzi. I have a question. Uh -huh. Um, when it comes to the um, the Wireshark PCAP NG, I guess, um, so extracting that file, is Modbus part of that PCAP file? Okay. Uh, I that's think, no question, sorry. No, no, not, not at all. I, I think I'm following what you're saying. So um, when you are capturing network traffic with Wireshark, you are sort of, um, it's almost like it really is basically listening on an interface. So whatever traffic that is kind of coming across your computer's uh, network interface card, that's what Wireshark is going to capture. So if there is Modbus traffic that your computer basically can, we'll say see, you know, that, that your um, network card is aware of, that, that will be captured. But, you know, if you're not on a Modbus network, uh, then, and, and I don't mean to say that Modbus is itself a separate network, but if you're not on a network such that you can see Modbus communications, then, you know, you, you won't get any Modbus traffic. So what I did for the demo is I was hoping to kind of do something a little bit more live and, and um, send traffic and interpret it, but the setup for it was kind of tricky. So what I did was um, I, I downloaded a, uh, PCAP with um, a lot of Modbus traffic to uh, 
to show you all. But if you're somewhere where there are Modbus devices and you can get on a network with them, then you can sort of um, capture your own Modbus traffic. I see. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Okay. I'm just going to double check the time real quickly. Ah, that's fine. I'll do that a little later. Um, okay. So, um, Modbus is a client server protocol. Uh, you might see master slave and documentation. We're kind of trying to move away from that terminology. So client server really sums it up nicely. Um, you have a client that's sort of reaching out, asking for stuff. Uh, you have a server that uh, sort of listens and uh, responds. Um, and, and this is a, a very similar model to like, if you think of a web server, that's typically just HTTP client server communication, really the same kind of way. Your web browser is a client. Um, and then the web server, right? Whatever hosts the content and responds to requests is a server. Um, so the client is going to have to reach out to servers to get data from there. Um, so more modern SCADA protocols use what's known as a public, publish subscribe model where um, servers isn't quite accurate for these other ones, but where the, uh, the devices generating the data can actually kind of get a list of uh, subscribers sort of like a magazine or something and then when it has something new based on what um you know these other devices have opted into it can sort of push that out this client server model is a little bit less sophisticated and the client has to ask to get data it's not going to you know get anything back for free it can't ask for things once and expect to get it back you know periodically or anything like that um typically in this case uh the client's going to be a plc or programmable logic controller so that's, that's often sort of the brains or maybe in a more distributed network, kind of like part of the brains of a, of a SCADA network. So it's a ruggedized computer. So it's, it's something that's going to be able to handle like high temperatures, maybe getting dropped, stuff like that. Um, what you'll actually find is that the computers themselves, like the, um, like sort of the clock speed and, and things like that, let's say RAM are often really behind the times. And that's not even uh, considering how old a lot of uh, PLCs are that are in use. They're really optimized for their physical durability as well as different IO. Like these, these devices will communicate via serial. They'll run um, RTOS's real-time operating systems where um, they're optimized for reliability. So, and they're optimized for um, uptime rather than something like Windows or even maybe Linux where it, it tries to be uh, general purpose, but um, these these RTOSs, which are um, often used to as the controllers in SCADA networks, they're really uh, very specialized. You know, they're not going to run some sort of email client or whatever. They're they're really meant to uh, communicate with these hardware devices. And so, anyway, um, controllers such as PLCs are very often the clients, the ones uh, reaching out and asking for information uh, via Modbus. And when I say via Modbus, I mean that they send Modbus requests using the Modbus protocol, and then they will hopefully uh, receive Modbus responses with, with the information that they ask for. Um, and so sensors and actuators, so just things that um, you know read from the environment, right, or also can affect the environment, um, are commonly uh, Modbus server devices that will be able to um, kind of transmit whatever data is requested back to a, a controller. Um, any questions on this slide? Okay. So here's just a really simple diagram, right? Uh, this, this almost looks very similar to um, anything that, that does uh, client server type stuff. Um, yep, so client sends out a request to the server. Um, uh, so uh, Modbus servers, here's something that we'll get into a little bit more later. Uh, they have what are known as registers. Um, so registers are basically just uh, chunks of data, really. Uh, in Modbus, I believe they're each 16 bits. Uh, we'll get into that a little bit more later. Uh, there are also coils, which we'll get into, which are, you could think of as differently sized registers. But uh, Modbus devices have registers that sort of hold values, right? It could hold, um, you know, what's the uh, ASCII text of my device's name, or maybe I don't know, I, I say how much RAM a device has, uh, but typically devices that are Modbus servers might be a lot simpler. So it could be, you know, maybe what is the baud rate? What is the communication speed of a device's serial port? Um, things like that. Um, so client sends a request out to the server uh, and clients can make, can request different types of information 
We'll get into more detail on that uh, as well. And then based on what the request was and based on the values in the register, the server will, will basically respond with the requested data. Um, any questions on this slide? Okay. So there are a bunch of different Modbus variants. Uh, this kind of stuff happens when your protocol is like 40 years old, I guess. Um, so I believe the original uh, is Modbus RT RTU. Um, I think that's like remote terminal, remote transmission unit, really, really designed for serial, right? Uh, so it has a binary data representation and it was meant to go over, over serial. So something like RS-232, something like that. Um, and then, so we've got Modbus ASCII. So this is human readable. So going back to that Wireshark example, um, Modbus ASCII, right? We could see that very clearly on the left, uh, sorry, on the right side, I'll even, uh, We'll go back really quickly. This right here, so this is interpreting the uh, sort of the raw binary or hexadecimal, however you, however it's displayed here, in this case, hexadecimal. It's interpreting the raw packet data in this third column as ASCII. And ASCII is, uh, it's basically a very common, very standard way to, um, to interpret uh, raw data, let's say hexadecimal data uh, as, as human readable text. So in a, in a text-based protocol, you're gonna be able to read it and sort of understand what's going on. In a binary protocol, this is sort of gonna be gibberish. Um, and you'll have to rely on your knowledge of the protocol or ideally also, you know, like something like a Wireshark dissector to explain what's going on. So we'll get back here. Yeah, so ASCII uh, is human readable. And so Modbus ASCII uh, sends information in a human readable format. Uh, I guess it's a little bit late in the presentation, but let's try to have a, a little bit more maybe um, kind of have a question that I'm wondering if uh, anyone could think about here. So we've got Modbus RTU, Modbus ASCII. So RTU uses binary data. So it's, it's not in a way that's innately human readable. Modbus ASCII is innately human readable. Um, there's definitely a clear advantage just with those two facts. Um, like ASCII is human readable, which is great, but RTU also has an advantage. Can anyone speculate on what that might be just between binary data versus uh, ASCII or human readable? Any ideas of an advantage that Modbus RTU might have over Modbus ASCII? Speed. Speed. Fantastic. Pretty much. Yeah. So because you have binary data, right? And you're not constrained by, oh, let's use a whole byte to represent a whole character. For those of you who are familiar with ASCII, you can really kind of have much more compact, uh, compact data representation. Yeah. So that's fantastic. So if, you know, if you're limited by network speed, since you're sending less, it'll, it'll, you know, go over the network more quickly. Um, you know, your, your PCAPs will be smaller. Uh, that's not, that might not be a super important consideration in this day and age, um, but especially if we're talking back, you know, 70s, 80s, whatever, like that was probably a pretty good reason to use RTU over ASCII. I, I don't understand the ins and outs of these, um, but but yeah, that was that was great. That was exactly what I was going for. Um, sorry about that. Um, so now we have Mobus TCP. So all these Mobus variants do the same kind of thing. They, you know, it's it's a SCADA protocol. Um, client server, that, that sort of stuff. But these, uh, these three things are, are really, they kind of have slightly different um, transport. I'll say transport layers to use the sort of networking terminology. I don't know what the equivalent, uh, the equivalent way to word it for serial is, but so Modbus RTU and ASCII are transported on serial data lines, whereas Modbus TCP is transported via TCP packets. And TCP is very, very common. So HTTP is over TCP. Um, TCP really um, is, is just used for like very, very many applications. So uh, to give a super brief overview, so TCP um, has like integrity checking, keeps track of sequence numbers and things like that. So if you want between TCP and UDP, there are other transport layers that are slowly gaining popularity, but TCP and UDP are both very old, very, you know, uh, well used and things like that. Uh, TCP is concerned with reliability and things like that, whereas UDP is, is sort of as simple as possible, going to send at the most volume. So UDP is great for things like video where you don't need, you know, if, if something gets slowed down in between and, and you lose a few pixels or whatever, it's not a huge deal. 
but this uh, TCP certainly makes sense, right? If we're sending Modbus um, over either of those two um, sort of uh, like IP transport layers, uh, we, we do care about reliability, right? You don't want to be, you know, running a factory and, and have something go wrong. And rather than have TCP sort of built in validation, just, just be like, oh, it's fine, uh, you know. So kind of makes sense why Modbus uh, is using TCP. And since it's using TCP, um, this variant is using TCP, it's able to, you know, this traffic is able to go over the internet or over like a, a LAN, a local area network. Um, and so since Modbus TCP, you know, is used, it's sort of the application layer sort of above TCP, and we'll see that pretty soon. It doesn't need to worry about its own checksums because TCP, the underlying networking layer, takes care of that. Whereas RTC and ASCII, they don't use TCP and they um, and checksums were deemed important, which is probably pretty responsible. So um, that had to be folded into those uh, those two protocol variants. Uh, any questions on this slide? Okay. So here's the Mobbus TCP frame format. Um, and this, this kind of stuff is really what gets um, sort of almost like fed into, really, you know, coded into a Wireshark dissector. Uh, so the first two, uh, I think these, yeah, okay, these are bytes. So the first two bytes um, are going to be the transaction identifier. So uh, this is so that the server and client are on the same page. They have the same transaction ID. Got the protocol identifier. I believe that this is different for different um, different Modbus variants. I can't say I'm certain. We're really just focusing on Modbus TCP. My understanding is that the event on Wednesday is that's that's going to be you know important. That's kind of why we're doing this uh, talk here. And let's see. So we've got the length field, right? So just the additional bytes, because what we'll see here is these first uh, five rows here, these first five uh, chunks of the frame are of fixed length, but this last one is of length n, so it can be you know any length depending on what was requested and what that value was. So that's why we have this length field here that makes it a lot more tidy. And so you know your um, client program is able to properly parse the, the data that comes back rather than you know sort of wondering how long it is. So we've got a server address here used to um, identify uh, Mamba servers function code. So this guy is really important. So this really determines um, really what type of thing the client is asking for. Um, and then we've got data bytes. Uh, so this is really the sort of the answer, if you will, like this is going to be what comes back and it, it's going to be the interesting information coming back from the, uh, the server. Um, any questions on this slide or about anything previous so far? Okay, so we've got common Modbus function codes. So these are these are ones that we're going to see all the time. So we'll talk about coils and registers really quickly again. So coils are just one bit, so that's simply a zero or one. So coils are really really simple, right? They take up a very small amount of of data. It's just is this thing on or off? So uh, I guess we'll make this interactive. It's pretty simple, but try to get some more engagement. So. What, what could be a scenario where a field device, um, right, like a, a sensor actuator or something like that, would have a coil? What could a coil uh, represent really well in sort of a physical sense? Any, any ideas? No, nothing? Okay, that's fine. It's a little bit maybe not worded quite the best, but so something that's really obvious could be, you know, is this switch on or off, right? Just something as simple as that could be represented really neatly as a coil. Um, so what what uh, you'll find if you're working kind of with SCADA type stuff, uh, SCADA protocols included, is that they do really try to be efficient. They try to, you know, not take up more memory than is needed. Uh, we had that whole binary protocol versus ASCII, uh, things like that. So if, uh, if you're able to read one bit and get the information you need rather than reading 16 bits, you know, that's fantastic. More so back in 1979 when, uh, when memory was way, way, way uh, more expensive and limited. But this, this uh, still, the protocol still works the same way. 
So um, you'll see that coils are only one bit, registers are 16 bits. So if you have a value that is larger, of course, you're going to need a register. I suppose you could use multiple coils. Uh, but for, for values that can simply be represented as like an on off zero one, um, that's when there'll be uh, coils. So these are various function codes um, and sort of based on the code, uh, this will affect sort of how the uh, server interprets the request and uh, what information it gives back in its response. Any questions on this slide? Okay. So this, uh, we definitely don't need to dwell on, um, but this is sort of the big list of documented mob bus function codes. So nothing is really preventing anyone from adding their own vendor specific extensions. This is super common for industrial protocols. That's actually part of why uh, at Percival, we wanted to extend a Wireshark dissector for something that was kind of like more particular to what we were looking at rather than you know uh, something that was generic and inherent to a protocol. Um, so anyway, there are a lot of different, uh, different functions here. Um, yeah, I, I guess we'll we'll probably see a few of them in in the uh, the PCAP when we open it up in Wireshark, but nothing really worth mentioning. I just wanted to make it clear that you know there there are other Modbus function codes that are documented, uh, as well as some that are not not sort of in the Modbus specification, uh, which you can read yourself uh, if if you're kind of uh, really bored or something or want to be really bored. Um, but that is linked at the end here, uh, but yeah, there. So there are protocols in the specification. The specification is is free, right? It's royalty free. It's available online. Uh, but vendors could also choose to basically program their Modbus client and Modbus server on their devices such that they understand different function codes and interpret them, interpret them sort of you know however the vendor wishes. Any questions on that? I think I might hear someone. Please feel free. Will, this is Yeti again. Mm -hmm. For um, Modbus, Modbus, excuse me, in um, Wireshark, is there a way to query that specific, um, like if we're looking for the zero one? Um, I think I think we can do what you're talking about. Uh, I. So we will open up Wireshark soon. And I guess if you can just sort of ask that again when we Got get it. to it, if, if it's not covered, because that, that awesome. is a great question. I know I'm kind of giving a lot of background and we sort of haven't gotten to the demo yet, but great question. No, no. My apologies, thank you. Oh yeah, no problem. Okay, so moving on, we're getting close to the demo. Oh, look at that. Okay, I didn't even, didn't even know. So. Let me know. I'm switching to. I'm switching over to Linux. Please let me know if if people can see Wireshark right now. Yes. Okay. Fantastic. So got this PCAP here, and so I had a filter on it. I'm going to kind of get rid of this filter, so we can spend a little bit of time uh, just talking about Wireshark now that it's sort of open and and you know I can click around and explain things. Uh, how is the um, the I guess what I'm saying is like, how is the screen size? Should I try to enlarge the text a bit? Would that help? Or is it, is it okay, the size of things here? Oh, is, there, okay. is there a way to do one, like zoom one? Uh, yeah, I can yeah, kind of do that one. Yep, that okay, awesome. awesome. Cool. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Um, yep, so. This is this is a PCAP that I got online. Uh, I, I basically just Googled Modbus, Modbus PCAP. You can obviously uh, capture your own um, with physical devices. There are also some Modbus simulators out there, but remember that this is an old protocol. And uh, I, I guess you would think that maybe there would be more simulators because it was used for a long time. But people who who are interested in writing these things might not be super excited by Modbus. So there are a few out there, but it, it kind of just took me longer than I had to prepare to, to get something like that up and running. Uh, but those are out there if that's something you're, you're interested in. Um, so let's see, so, you know, we've got this, uh, this PCAP open. So we could, we could click this uh, kind of shark fin to start capturing. But in this case, uh, this is, we just sort of opened a static file that was already captured here. Um, and what we'll see is the protocol here. 
And so we've got TCP here and we've got Modbus TCP. So like Modbus over TCP, I'll close these for right now. And so what's happening is this kind of goes back to the uh, OSI model. The protocols are, are really, or the, uh, the layers are really one on top of another. So this one here, we've got frames, we've got the physical layer, uh, ethernet, IP, TCP. So this Modbus uh, packet also has, it has Modbus, but it has all these sort of preceding layers. Uh, and that's just sort of common how networking works, but something that uh, can be helpful for new users of Wireshark is, so we're gonna do a filter really quickly and we're just gonna take all the TCP. Um, we're gonna only display TCP packets, which will probably be the majority here. Um, and oh, in fact, it was all the packets. So not quite the best example, but it still shows what I wanted to uh, convey, which is that this Modbus over TCP packet is still a TCP packet. So when you filter, you're still gonna get it. And that is, you know, that is correct. It's a TCP packet. We could filter IP, right? We could filter sort of a layer, a layer more fundamental up and down on the networking stack can be confusing. The way Wireshark shows it is like, this is sort of the most fundamental, the, the physical layer. And then we get down to um, the application layer here at the bottom. Uh, but so if we were to do IP, um, it, it's still going to display the same things, right? Because all of these packets are also IP. Um, but now we'll kind of get to what's a little bit more relevant. And so we'll filter for Modbus. So uh, Wireshark's got this really nice tab completion type thing, right? I don't know if it's technically tab completion. Okay, I guess not. But it's got this uh, sort of autocomplete. So I started typing MO and this sort of showed all the, all the protocols it knows about. So that could be something, I know there's a great question about like supported SCADA protocols. So for example, might not always be the most intuitive, but if you're looking for the S7 comms, you can just start typing S7 and there's none of that traffic in here. Uh, so it won't show anything, uh, but or if, if I hit enter, it shouldn't show anything. But um, you know, that's how you can filter for sort of whatever protocol you want. Um, any questions so far? Please feel free. We've still got, you know, almost 20 more minutes. So, um, you know, I, I'm sure this is the first time a few of you have seen Wireshark, which is which is great. Okay, so let's see here. Clean this up a bit so we can see. And on a bigger screen too, it's really nice. Like you can, you know, make things whatever size you want and things like that. Um, so all these packets are Modbus over TCP which is great, that's what we want to talk about. Uh, pop this open. And this is going back to that whole uh, binary versus like ASCII, right, human readable thing. So these are all representations of the same data. I don't think I did a great job of explaining it and it's a lot easier to do um, visually. So as I'm mousing over here, uh, you'll notice that things both on the uh, sort of this first column here and this third column, they're, they're kept in parallel because these are the exact same data. It's just being represented in uh, these two different ways. So in this case, uh, what hopefully uh, you all will notice is that since this is, and to be fair, these are other sections of the packet, uh, these here, like you can see them all highlighted at once. Oops, see them. Oh, I guess you can't multi-select those because this is all the frame. I think you can for these, nope. Okay, but so this, these kind of last parts are really just the MABA section of the packet. Uh, but what you'll notice is that, you know, there's nothing really human readable there, right? When, when we're trying to convert the, uh, the hexadecimal into ASCII, it's, it's a bunch of dots. They're basically unprintable characters for the most part. Um, so where I'm going with that is that this is still a binary protocol. So it's not like Modbus ASCII over TCP. It's, it's more similar to Modbus RTU. Um, and so that's what's really great about having Wireshark to, uh, to be able to interpret things. Um, any questions so far? Okay, so uh, these these here, this is sort of the chunk of data that's specific to Modbus over TCP. Um, so hopefully you sort of recognize these, you've got transaction identifier, protocol identifier, length, unit identifier, right? So um, these are, these are those first fields in the, um, in the, what am I trying to say here, in, in that table. And what you'll notice here is that the length matches up with what we're seeing. This is sort of that, um, that N, right? The, the chunk of size N is the packet that, or is the, uh, the section that says Modbus, that's, that's the data. So this says six, that means uh, six bytes. And if we see here, 
Uh, it's a little bit confusing because um, using Wireshark, you'll have to get used to what is actually in the packet uh, compared to what is given to you by the dissector. You know, Wireshark makes it really great. You can just peek at it and, and kind of see what's going on, but you do want to try to think critically and sort of get a feel for um, what is actually in the raw packet versus what is sort of being labeled for you. Uh, so one really great way to do that, that I do all the time is really to just like click here and sort of uh, hit the arrow up and down or click around and it'll, it'll show you like this line corresponds to just this single byte. So um, hopefully it's now kind of become clear that so this line is one byte, this line is one byte. These guys are four bytes. So even though it looked like, wait a second, data, we have these four zeros. If we assume each one's a byte, like it's only, um, it's uh, only four bytes, but then this section here is a byte, this section here is a byte, and that's how we got the length of six. Um, any questions so far? Okay, so we'll look at some of the, uh, the various um, function codes. So uh, this is the diagnosis code here. There's some really cool things we can do with Wireshark. Um, so oh, what I did was I right-clicked and I'm gonna hit apply as column. And so this is going to show all of the function codes. So this is the same packet, right? This is the same information. We didn't add anything. All we're doing is using Wireshark to sort of uh, get it in. Oh, I didn't mean to sort that, although I don't think it matters, is to just get it in a representation that works better for us. So, um, so we're able to see various function codes. Uh, and we can look at something that might be like a little bit uh, better here, a little bit easier to work with. Uh, so see something like read coils, so that's perfect. So this is, here's a question. So this is a, a Modbus query, or you could think of it as a Modbus request, like, you know, these are synonyms. So in this case, can someone see based on this line 51 that I have highlighted, um, which IP is the, uh, the client and which IP is the server? Any thoughts here? Uh, do I need to sort of clarify that a bit? Any any I ideas? Think uh -huh. Doug was saying something in um, in the chat. Oh, let's see. Okay, so we've got point nine as a client, point three as a server. That sounds right to me. Ooh. Yeah, fantastic. So, oh, sorry about that. So we've got the. Uh, Yep, the query packet, right? So the source where it's getting sent from is going to be the uh, the client, so 10.0.0.9. And then the destination where it's going is going to be the server. So very good. So I saw two answers in the chat. They're both correct. Um, and so, you know, hopefully this part isn't a surprise, right? This is the response here. And then, um, you know, we're seeing that this is the server responding to the client. Uh, there was a really good question earlier about um, sort of being able to sort or filter based on uh, kind of like values within the packet. So you can absolutely do that. Uh, this example is a little bit different, but I think it might even be slightly more practical. Um, so we see that in the info sort of, um, you know, I, I guess the info column here uh, for each row for each packet, uh, Wireshark is kind of giving a really nice overview here. So what we should be able to do is identify the field that they use and then be able to um, sort of filter for only queries or only responses. And to be honest, I don't even know what it is off the top of my head, but that's great. We have Wireshark. So what I'm going to do is we've got this query packet. I'm going to hit the down arrow and sort of flip back and forth and see how the response packet is different. And feel free. This is not one of those questions that I know the answer to yet, uh, but feel free to... Um, to suggest if, if you think you found it. I think I might have found it, but I'll, I'll give you guys a little bit of time if, if you want to speculate on how we can identify query versus response. Actually, I'm not sure again. So definitely feel free to let me know how we can identify this. But we should be able to because Wireshark is able to identify it. And Wireshark is not magic. Wireshark simply uses the, uh, the protocol specification. So we see that the transaction identifier is the same, which is what we'd expect. Unit identifier is the same, so we're not seeing a lot of things that are different. So what could be different?
different here. We could even poke into the Modbus traffic only, the Modbus traffic itself. So we've got the function code, byte count, bit number. So this is a reference number. Oh, this one might have to be, I hope not, but I don't want to take too long. So this one might have to be left as a sort of an exercise for the reader here. Um, but there is absolutely a way to sort of uh, isolate either the queries or the responses. It's kind of more obvious for a lot of other protocols, uh, but there should be a way. One thing we can try doing is the dot notation. Uh, for a lot of protocols, Wireshark supports this where you can drill down to a particular um, facet of that protocol. So in fact, if we even right click here, it might show where it got it from. See this function code? I, I was able to add that field by right clicking and doing uh, add as column, but you can see exactly what they did by uh, right clicking and then kind of seeing this, this information on the right. So as a really quick example, just cause we're running low on time, do something like this. And then we could filter by the function code. And then, you know, it's whatever equals or using this double equal sign. And this is going to be a numeric code. I don't think we can compare it with the um, sort of the string values that got decoded based on the specification. So if we want to read coils, we would just do one. This is the same number as the table. And this is going to isolate only the, um, the uh, mob bus functions that read coils. So let's try it really quickly. If there's something that can answer what I was kind of wondering about with the stop notation. So there's quite a bit here. Um, let's see if there's something obvious here. I'm not seeing it. Anything that seems uh, to indicate whether it is a query or response. So we've got response time. Hey, uh, Will, you can uh, just filter on the IP of that server. And then from there, then just add an and and filter for the function you're looking for. Yeah, that's, that is a fantastic idea. Yep. So there should be a way to do what I was trying to do. But that is, yeah, that is great. So did everyone catch that? So we're able to... Um, we could do something like IP dot, so it's like source dot port or source underscore port. I think it's just source in this case. And so if we want to find, um, or, or sorry, not port, but actually IP. So if we want to find the queries in this case, um, just do something like this. And so because all this traffic is Modbus, or actually, no, no, it is not. So we can uh, and our filters here, do something like this. And so now we are seeing all of the Modbus queries because we've identified uh, the client IP. Yeah, that's really fantastic. Thank you for that. Um, yeah, so uh, this is a really good way to go about it. Uh, you know, there are kind of more than one way to, to do that, although <laughs> I guess this is the only one I'm aware of. Um, let's see. And so we can dig in a little bit more to what's actually going on in the Modbus uh, traffic. Now, this is a big part of really all this kind of packet analysis, protocol analysis is like, you need to uh, you need to have an understanding of what's going on in the system for this analysis to be useful. So we only have one side of this, right? So we can only see, okay, you know, coils are being um, written to, read from, things like that. Uh, so it's a little bit hard to, we're not gonna have the full picture of what's actually happening, but then let's say, okay, well, we know that the, um, let's go back. Up here, we know that the, uh, oh, it looks like there are multiple um, clients here too. Uh, but so let's say that we know that point three uh, dot, like uh, 10.0.0.3 is a Modbus server uh, and we know it's IP, right? So if we have a PCAP that has other traffic or if we're able to access that host, that IP, we could then try to figure out, hey, does it have a web server? Can I identify what this device is and get a better feel for um, you know, what this stuff really might be, like what, what the coils might represent and things like that. One uh, really good thing to do too is to simply look for strings. And I know I said that uh, Modbus TCP is not, is, a, is basically binary. It's not outright human readable, but some of the binary, I believe in this, hopefully in, this, in these packets uh, that I checked earlier, should have some uh, human readable, basically ASCII strings. So I think this is, yep, so this is one of them. Um, so this is report slave ID. Uh, hopefully they, uh, they update the terminology, but um, we've got, uh, so this is a request asking for the ID of the server and then our response coming back from the server. Um, so we're able to see that. Uh, so this looks like gibberish, right? It's, it's just because that 
um, DID here, this could be a hexadecimal value. The Wireshark dissector isn't claiming that it has to be ASCII text, but then we can see here, this value uh, is, is wing path limited. Uh, and you know that's, that clearly seems like text to me, and this probably identifies like the vendor of the, uh, the end device. So what you can do is it might not even be linear depending on the order that um, you know sort of queries are set. But if you have a PCAP, which I, I believe uh, there will be for the CTF, uh, you can sort of search through it and sort of try to glean this information from sort of maybe the lower hanging fruit, like things that are strings. Um, and from there you can uh, try to sort of piece together almost like a narrative of what could be going on. And what happens a lot of times, both in the real world and perhaps in the CTF, is that you'll be given a scenario, so it's not completely starting from nothing. So you might have enough information to then be able to match up, oh, I read a coil, right? It has this value. Remember, these values can only be zero or one, um, and kind of go from there. So we don't have too much time left. Um, are there any other questions? Well, you might, I think this was um, great. Yeah, thank you. We, we just have a couple more minutes left. Um, do you have any additional resources you could share um, that are, you found helpful that you could share with the, the audience? Oh, uh, great question. So really, so my bus is so old, uh, you can Google and <laughs> nothing has changed. But um, I did include resources on the last slide that were really the things that I found helpful uh, when preparing. Um, and so these are really great slides. These go into more technical detail. Uh, so if you're someone who already has that background, uh, or I'm sorry, this, uh, really these, both of these slides, but especially the black hat slides, uh, go into some really nice technical detail with uh, doing pen testing, so security testing. Uh, of protocols, including Modbus. So I definitely recommend that for uh, people who are, you know, interested in that kind of stuff and have a little bit of a, a networking background. Um, these are where I got a lot of the, uh, the tables from, and it gives a really nice overview. Wikipedia article is great. Oh, oh, okay. I got this one mixed up. So this top one, there it is. So this top one is the Modbus specification. So this is sort of the, you know, the reference document. This is the the standard for Modbus. And uh, what you'll notice if you work with industrial protocols is it can be really frustrating trying to get this information, especially without paying a lot of money. Uh, so it's pretty great that the Modbus one is out there. So, you know, that's something uh, you can look over. And these resources are sort of people who have already looked over it and tried to distill it in, you know, maybe a, a practical way or an overview because uh, this the specification is quite large. Um, but yeah, that was, that was a great question. I, I hope this was a, hope these resources uh, will be useful. Um, any, anything else? I think that's it. So, uh, like I said, we've, we're recording these sessions. Um, we're going to get them uploaded to, to YouTube as part of the, the whole session. We have some additional training tomorrow. Um, if you guys go to that link I shared earlier, um, or just Google hack the airport, um, you can register for some additional sessions. Um, we'll also be doing a little intro onto the platform we'll be using for the CTF. Um, and then, yeah, I shared, I shared William's uh, LinkedIn as well. So connect with him. Um, and uh, thank you all for joining. Um, and we hope to see you tomorrow and Wednesday. It's going to be under uh, WESIS uh, CI. Okay.